December 28, 2016 marked the end of Archie Sonic's 20 plus year run. An entire world of Sonic the Hedgehog would stop just like that. For many people, this was the unfortunate end of many of their favorite characters, both new and old. For others, it was about time for the series to ultimately kick the bucket. But regardless if you are a day one fan or a certified hater, there are multiple questions left unanswered. What's going to happen with Sonic comics? Is the Archie cast going to get any closure? Why did the comics get cancelled? What did Sonic mean by this? Thankfully, it looked like the future of Sonic comics would get a new home, as only a few months later, Sonic the Hedgehog would be back in comic book form under a new publisher, IDW. The IDW Sonic comics are the latest and supposedly greatest comic series to grace the shelves for over five years, bringing Sonic and Co. into a familiar setting with brand new characters to boot. No longer are we tied to decades old continuity, convoluted stories, and publicly hated figures established by previous comics. We now have a Sonic series that aims to be the fresh breath of air we've all been waiting for, right? Well, the last time we looked at this comic, those hopes and dreams turned out to be nothing more than false promises. But maybe, just maybe, I was wrong. Maybe I need to do a proper reevaluation of the series from start to finish to see what really makes this comic tick. The good, the bad, and the unfortunate parts of the series. Just like Sonic said in this comic, we should give everyone a second chance. So ladies and gentlemen, long story short, it's time to strap your seatbelts because this is going to be a long one. Let's take a look at IDW Sonic the Hedgehog, the entire series. Issues 1 through 4 gives us the introductory story arc, Fallout, where we get to see what Sonic has been doing all this time after Forces. After saving a nearby militia, Tails arrives to save Sonic in the nick of time. He gives Sonic the rundown that someone might be in control of Eggman's robots ever since his abrupt absence. Sonic decides to speed off, but not before he gives Tails a little pep talk. And that is essentially the formula for the remaining three other stories. Sonic goes to a town to stop a badnik and talk to his friends who try to convince him to join the army. He leaves because he's free like the wind. There's a bad guy behind the tall chair, rinse and repeat. Yes, I know that this set of issues introduces newcomers Rough and Tumble along with Tangle the Lemur, but the book itself does not establish anything significant about these new guys. We do get to see the return of the Archie staff, Ian Flynn back on board with the story, and art by Tracy Yardley, Adam Bryce Thomas, Jennifer Hernandez, and Evan Stanley. Yardley and Thomas both give Sonic and Co. a much more dynamic look to their movement, especially Thomas, who knocked it out of the park with issue 2. Stanley's art does look wonderful with a dash of silly facial expressions here and there. Hernandez's artwork didn't do it for me, as I found her art pretty static and the line art a bit too thick for my liking. Overall, Fallout doesn't set the bar that high for this comic series. It almost feels like attempting to tie itself to forces wasn't the greatest idea ever. Here's hoping that the next story arc ups the stakes higher than whatever this was. 5 and 6 gives us a short two-part adventure on the fate of Dr. Eggman. Sonic joins up with the Chaotix this time around, who somehow got Eggman's location. The locals at the village note that something has changed with the famed Doctor. He's got amnesia and now is a good guy named Mr. Tinker. Sonic isn't fully convinced, even citing that he's still a threat regardless, but the locals want him around as he's been helping out the village. But before anything can be discussed, Badniks arrive on the scene. Mr. Tinkerer cowers in fear over the robots, which convinces Sonic that maybe he's truly lost all that evil in him. Sonic and the Chaotix save the day, and it looks like Tinker may have a bit of Eggman inside of him. Pause. Shadow and Rouge arrive on the scene, and thus introduces one of the most controversial aspects of this comic book. The characterization of Sonic the Hedgehog. Oh boy. So Shadow brings up some valid points that just because Eggman has ultimately lost his memory doesn't mean he can't pose a threat, which Sonic initially agreed with. While this argument does bring up a moral dilemma in which we should punish someone for crimes that they have no knowledge of, 
His argument ultimately falls apart with using not only Shadow as an example, but also the person he's defending. I'm not gonna go too much into detail with this since I literally have a whole video about this specific topic, but manipulating your friend and outright threatening him to believe that your plan is morally correct is just absolutely baffling. And to top it off, this is apparently considered the right thing to do. Man, I sure hope that these actions don't have any sort of consequence whatsoever. <laughs> what do you think? Tinker shows off Eggman Land as a little amusement park, and it looks like there's two Eggmans? The fate of Dr. Eggman is a little better than the previous story arc, but it does foreshadow the issues at hand with its protagonist. Seven sends us high into the sky with Sonic and Tails, chasing an Eggman airship. After a beautifully illustrated montage of Sonic storming through the place, he meets up with not Eggman, but Neo Metal Sonic, that's the name, don't wear it out, who has taken over it for Eggman. He tells Sonic that he'd been reprogrammed without any rebellious software, and is doing anything in his power to find Eggman. The two of them fight, and when it looks like Sonic bites the bullet, he hits him with this epic quote. Okay, but for real though, what's up with the usage of song lyrics as actual lines of dialogue? While the heroes celebrate, Neo Metal Sonic has just arrived on Angel Island. I really enjoyed this action-oriented adventure. Sonic fighting against a horde of Metal's forces was a treat, and there was a bit of tension with Neo Metal copying Sonic's data. It does kinda suck that ultimately this is a nothing burger, with Sonic failing to get any data from the airship, and this attempt of fan service is painfully laughable. But the art definitely puts this on a whole nother level. Our first banger of a story right here. Issue 8 stars everyone's favorite hedgehog from the future, Silver, exploring an Eggman base with Sonic, and a newcomer to the mix, Whisper, who's portrayed here kinda like the strong silent type to the cast. Silver kinda does meet ride Whisper here. They all team up and fight a giant E-series robot. Sonic and Silver check Eggman's search history and find out that Neo Metal Sonic is pulling up to Angel Island, which leads us into the battle for Angel Island. Issue 8 is all right. A noticeable step down from issue 7, especially with the overly nerdy portrayal of Silver here, and the mysterious introduction of Whisper, who feels like all show and a little bit of tell, it leaves a bit to be desired at the end of the day. 9 through 11 finally gives us the big battle with Neo Metal Sonic and the Resistance in the Battle for Angel Island. Knuckles is absolutely tweaking over his island being taken over. The squad decides to pull up on the battle bus and teams to take out Metal. While on the ship, we get a brief moment with everyone before the battle. Shadow's here too for his own reasons, whatever that means. Amy and Blaze question if they should trust Whisper, and everybody else is gambling their life savings away. The battle bus gets downed, Blaze goes super, and Sonic and Knuckles face Super Neo Metal Sonic. Things are getting a bit crazy, as Super Neo Metal proves to be literally unstoppable for the two. Everyone else hijacks another Eggman airship and uses it to take out the remaining badniks. Also, Eggman, I mean, uh, Mr. Tinker, gets kidnapped. Shadow finally decides to show up in the comic and then starts beating Super Neo up. Sonic tries to warn him that Neo Metal Sonic can copy his data, but he hits him with this line out of nowhere. Super Neo evolves and becomes the Master Overlord. Let's wrap things up with issue 11. Sonic, Knuckles, and Shadow get caught by the Master Overlord. Sonic's bright idea is just hitting Metal Sonic with some world-class name-calling, which gives everyone enough time to jump him. Knuckles gets his Master Emerald, Metal Sonic is defeated, and Shadow just heads out. Meanwhile, we get to see what's going on with Mr. Tinker. He's introduced to Dr. Starline, who decides to turn him back into the Eggman we know and love through the Thug Shaker mind control. And that was Battle for Angel Island. All things considered, it's a fun adventure that raises the stakes pretty well. But the way Flynn got to that final stage of Metal Sonic's evolution was really contrived, compromising Shadow's characterization in order to do so. The finale itself felt so abrupt with the crew taking Metal down pretty easily, and it didn't help that Sonic's Your Mama joke moment made the situation feel a bit unserious. It's enjoyable through the buildup, but the climactic finale in question felt like another adventure to be put in Sonic's catalog. Our last issue for this year decides to give us a bit of closure on the previous event. Sonic decides that the best thing to do after that chaotic event is to bring Metal Sonic back online, which has got to be the stupidest thing he's ever done. For some reason, he believes that Metal Sonic has the capacity to live his own life now, 
Disregarding the fact that he is now 100% loyal to Eggman, you'd think reprogramming him would have been the safer option, or I don't know, just leave him deactivated? But oh well, despite Metal's harsh decline to Sonic's offer, Sonic just sees this and decides that he and Tails just have to respect his decision. Would you believe me if I told you that this event kickstarted a worldwide robot virus? No? Well, watch closely. Starline's mind control proves to be utterly useless, Metal comes knocking on Eggman's door, and miraculously, he causes Eggman to regain all of his memories back. He recruits Starline and the Skunks, and even gets all seven of the Chaos Emeralds as a welcoming gift too. While the heroes all give their goodbyes, Eggman showcases his latest and greatest creation, which we'll soon get a glimpse of in the future. While it was nice to see some sort of issue giving us closure on this event, it was incredibly frustrating seeing how Flynn went with starting the next one. Making characters act stupid for the sake of plot convenience has never worked. Sonic disregarding Tails' warnings to dish out another batch of his morality code makes me wish that this was never introduced into this comic. Outside of that, the rest of the comic was... Fine. A decent issue at best that harbors a whole lot of questionable baggage from start to finish. Two thousand eighteen was quite the year for this comic. Mediocrity seemed to be the standard for introducing the world to this new series. It's already given us some poor characterization of some iconic characters, villains and heroes that have yet to make an impact, and comics that seem to share the identity of a cardboard box. Hopefully with the new year on the horizon, IDW Sonic will have a chance to truly spread its wings, with a new event to take the world by storm. Issue 13 begins the Metal Virus story arc. Lasting almost 20 issues, this event would turn Sonic's world upside down. While Sonic and Tails are dealing with Thing 1 and Thing 2 over here at the local village, Dr. Eggman shows Starline the Metal Virus, a weird goo that turns the average living thing into a mindless zombie with just one touch. Starline also shows the portal capabilities of the warped Topaz, so the two can spy on Sonic and Tails' battle. Rough and Tumble are defeated and sent back to Eggman's base through a portal. Starline decides that it's his time to shine and leads Silver and Sonic up in the mountains by dropping some info about an Eggman base, but the two are ambushed by Metal Sonic. Starline proves to be quite the challenge for Sonic and Silver. He even decides to pull a funny prank and blows up the base with the two of them inside there. Bitch, I'm about to blow up! He just, you know, he just loves to do a little bit of some trolling, guys. Eggman gets mad that Starline almost killed them because he wanted to do it first, but surprise, surprise, they're fine. Kinda. While Silver is in the hospital for overdosing on weed for something, I, I don't know, Sonic and Amy decide to investigate another Eggman base. But before we can continue with that adventure, it's time to introduce our first spin-off on our list, the IDW Annuals. The Annuals are a set of various stories set in the Sonic universe, usually starring side characters and illustrated and written by various staff, new and old. For 2019, we have a total of five stories to look at. So let's make this quick, cause we do have a robo-zombie apocalypse waiting for us at the end. First up is Tangle taking Whisper on a tour of Spiral Hill Village. But that soon gets interrupted by the Babylon Rogues, who ransack Jewel the Beatles Museum and steal all of her valuables, accidentally kidnapping her in the process. Tangle and Whisper sneak onto the ship, take back the items, and rescue Jewel. A pretty short and sweet adventure. Can't really say the same for Jet Set Tornado, written by TSR one-shot writer Caleb Golner, and illustrated by newcomer Jack Lawrence. Sonic and Tails are testing out a new booster for the tornado. A bad Nick speeds by with some resistance supplies. They speed through some geyser, Sonic smashes the bad Nick, and the day is saved. It's definitely better than the last Golner story, but man, I just don't like the dialogue. Bringing in all this technical rigmarole in this short story makes me want to go to sleep. Kinda sucks that this awkward dialogue is paired with some pretty decent artwork from Lawrence. 
While the head shapes do look kind of funny and stretched out here and there, it's still pretty good. Victory Garden brings in Evan Stanley back into the writing department with GG Dutrix. Blaze finds Silver and Lil Bro has no idea how to start creating a marijuana garden. Despite me not being a fan of Cornball Silver and IDW, I do have to admit that this story is pretty nice. Blaze drops some pretty inspirational quotes for Silver on listening and providing for his plants. And the artwork is gorgeous. Stanley's paint-esque coloring gives us a beautiful look. For Stanley's first story in IDW, it's wonderful. Curse of the Pyramid stars everyone's least favorite duo, Ruff and Zumble, venturing through one of Dr. Eggman's pyramids. Written this time by Doctor Who writer Kevin Scott, in art from Diana Skelly. This goofy little story has the skunks versus Rouge to see who can get Dr. Eggman's treasures. But uh oh, Rouge gets hit with the Pharaoh's curse. But it was all a big prank, and it looks like she even got paid for doing all that. Overall, it was a bit silly, it was a bit goofy. It was just fine. Lastly, ladies and gentlemen, The Sonic Fan Club, written by James Kachakla and art by John Gray. It's easily the biggest nothing burger of the stories. A bunch of kids start a club. They fight an egg pond. Tangle pulls up, but kind of fumbles the job. But thankfully, Sonic saved the day, and thus ends our first annual. Overall, the side stories were fun. It was great to see the comic having some sort of outlet to focus on the side characters a bit. The addition of having multiple artists and writers helped each story to stand out. With the exception of the Golner story, this was a fun time. But anyway, back to the main event. While Sonic and Amy are exploring generic Eggman base number 4, Eggman finally decides to put the Metal Virus on the streets and uses rough and tumble as test subjects. When the duo resort to using Plan B, they get glazed and turn into Zombots. And poor Sonic just caught the case of Metal Virus 2. The stakes get higher as only the temporary cure at this point is Sonic Speed. Eggman launches the Face Ship, an airship that dumps nothing but Metal Virus goo all over the place. Things are looking pretty grim for the heroes as the Face Ship makes its way to oh. New York and starts dumping more ooze. Sonic meets up with the Chaotix and try their best to round up as many survivors as possible but poor Sonic can only help out for so long until the virus consumes him. Then, we get hit with Charmy trying to save an infected person the team left behind. This is just foreshadowing one of the many really stupid decisions that the crew makes to keep this story going. So get used to this happening. A lot. Eggman finds out that the Zombots have stopped responding to vocal commands. Starline does question why Eggman didn't think of this happening, and if there's some sort of plan to control it, which he didn't think of. This soon has Starline questioning the man he's been idolizing from the start. A don't meet your heroes kind of moment for him. As Sonic heads to Vanilla's house, he's stopped by Gemeral, who tells him that he's gotta go. And to be honest, Gemeral is kinda right here. Sonic is a threat with all of that Zombot glaze on him, and so are the Zombots. But soon Cream is brought into the scene to essentially nerf Gemeral for plot convenience. So, Gemeral does make a compromise and stop them in a non-lethal manner. Sonic helps get Cream and Vanilla out of their house, and he soon gets a call from a Latina over in Chicago. So Sonic and Team Dark pull up in Chicago to fight more Zombots and save more people. But wait, hold up, hold up, hold up. Where's Shadow? Huh? Homie pulls up in the big body Tonka, and he is not having it with all of Sonic's BS. If Sonic had just let Shadow take care of Eggman way back when, literally none of this would have happened. But then, Shadow becomes victim to not only the metal virus, but bad writing too. Disregarding Sonic's cautions with the dumbest line in the series so far, what is bro waffling about here? I still don't understand why Flynn decided that the best way to portray Shadow in this new series is to make him a semi-narcissistic douchebag who doesn't even listen to his friends and always has a chip on his shoulder. Even outside of this event, as we'll see later on, this personality of his just keeps getting him into more trouble. Sonic deals with the Metal Virus Shadow and others, thanks to some help from Omega. But even he's having some trouble as Omega gets dismantled and all that's left of the homie is just his head. Back at the restoration, things are just getting worse. With SBO and Vector going out on the lookout for their infected B-Buddy, Sonic gets a new Apple Watch that can check his stats for a possible cure, and Starline has the bright idea of using the Zeddies to help control the Zombots. 
21 through 23 features the same day, but on a different character's perspective. The only theme of each of these stories is that something bad happens to the cast in some way, shape, or form, regardless of how contrived it is. Such as, Tails quite literally having the cure, but only losing it because he got spooked. The restoration falling because security is not a priority, and bringing in the contaminated subject in a room made of non-contaminated people is the smartest thing to do. And the cherry on top of this mess of a Sunday is another adventure of Sonic's poor moral grandstanding, in which he goes back on his word of respecting people's decisions to attempt to force Eggman to become someone that he isn't. At least I have to give points to Sonic threatening to lock Eggman up and even questioning if he's made the right decision of letting him go, even though those threats are never followed up. One thing to note during this interaction is Starline. He finally realizes the general stupidity of his idol. He's finally come to terms that he really shouldn't have met his hero. This doesn't help the fact that moments later, Eggman revealed that he had no backup plan like a vaccine or a failsafe whatsoever. Sonic destroys his new Rolex, and at the end of issue 23, we see that Starline continues his quest to get the Zeddy on board. Before we finish things up with the virus, however, we got one more side adventure to look at, because while the Metal Virus event was happening, IDW published a four-part miniseries on Tangle and Whisper in order to help flesh out these newcomers a bit more and give us a bit more backstory on the mysterious Guardian Angel. After telling Jewel about her previous adventures, Tangle is interrupted by Whisper, who is attacking definitely not Sonic. This fake Sonic tricks Tangle into fighting Whisper for a bit, but she reveals that this Sonic is indeed fake. Apparently, this guy turned into this guy, and it's up to these two to stop him. They track Mimic down to an abandoned Eggman base, but Mimic tricks Tangle into walking into a comically large safe, and Whisper gets hit with a case of PTSD. Mimic turns into Whisper's presumably dead comrades, accusing her of giving up on her own friends when they needed her the most. Whisper saves Tangle, and with the dust finally settling down, Whisper decides that it's time to give Tangle her backstory. Whisper was part of a local gang called the Diamond Cutters. They do crazy missions and were pretty good at it. But of course, all good things must come to an end. And one of their members, Mimic, essentially sold out their group to Dr. Eggman. The Diamond Cutters are killed by Shadow Androids, and because of this event, Whisper has dedicated herself to continue the fight in their legacy as the Guardian Angel. Tangle decides to stick by her side no matter what, and the finale of this adventure takes place back at the original Diamond Cutter base. As Whisper battles the Badniks, Tangle and Mimic in the meantime fight, but Mimic proves to be quite the challenge. Whisper pulls up on him and is soon about to shoot Mimic, but Tangle decides that instead of her doing that, they should put him in a cell so that he will remember his failure? What? Mimic gets put in the gas chamber and the two of them leave their separate paths. Tangle and Whisper is a fantastic, emotionally driven story that focuses on the themes of forgiveness with Whisper and the loss of her crew. While the last part of this adventure did feel anticlimactic, I gotta say, 3 out of 4 isn't that bad at all. Anyways, back to the Metal Virus. We finally end this year off with issue 24. Sonic makes his way back to Spiral Village, stopping Zombots as usual. Not without Espio scolding Sonic again on his reckless actions. Instead of trying to understand Espio's point, Sonic decides that the best response is to come up with an extreme scenario to make his argument sound better. Despite the fact that the person in question he's trying to defend has a long history of committing various world-ending crimes. Tangle sacrifices herself to give the heroes more time to rescue more people and get out of Spiral Village. Whisper gets sad, like, dang, bro is absolutely losing it. And Starline's big plan to control the Zombots is about to go into motion. The first segment of the Zombot story has been pretty messy. While the premise is a fun concept and the beginning really does show how powerless the heroes are, it soon develops into a domino effect of everyone committing low IQ tactics to artificially extend this already long story. Our main character becomes the center of contention as he doesn't want to take full blame on something that has costed the lives of many and would rather manipulate his friends again into still believing that he was in the right all this time. The Metal Virus is a case of having a great concept but abysmal execution as the story progresses.
2019 is truly the year of the virus Norfest and two OCs who, surprisingly enough, stole the show with a bit of an enjoyable annual down the middle. While Flynn demonstrates that he can provide an emotionally deep story and give us a reason to care about Tangle and Whisper, he also shows that sometimes you gotta let a story just end. And the metal virus is no exception. We're almost done with the storyline as 2020 delivers us the end of the metal virus saga. Ladies and gentlemen, we have finally reached our first milestone issue of the series, issue 25. While it may look bright and cheery on the main cover, we're still stuck with Anthros vs. Robotic Ooze. This time the heroes land on Angel Island to give Knuckles the details. Starline's plan to use the Zeti severely backfires, and the villains have to retreat on the floating island while the Zeti take control of Eggman's forces. Back on the restoration base, Eggman reveals that he didn't have a cure for the virus and it's gonna take a while for the Zombots to dissolve. Silver comes to the future to say that something bad did indeed happen, and Whisper attempts to snipe Eggman in the head. But Cream stops her because the heroes need Eggman's help to stop the virus. I guess this is supposed to be emotionally significant, but this is starting to feel like a mini montage of Whisper crying. It feels like the Whisper we saw from the miniseries is not the same Whisper from the main series comic. Anyway, Eggman comes up with the idea of using the Warp Topaz to get the Chaos Emeralds back and sends Starline through the Rick and Morty portal. The Babylon Rogues pull up and Eggman makes a multi-portal generator for everyone to jump in. Sonic can't join the party since he's gotta run off more of that virus gunk, so who better to choose than Gemral and Cream to fight a Zeti, the same creatures who are known for controlling machinery. Is bro stupid? What advantage are you even waffling about? But we aren't done yet, as we're dished out with another episode of Sonic's morality. This time backtracking again on his own words of respecting people's decisions by scolding Metal Sonic for not changing like Gemeral or Omega, despite the fact that Metal Sonic told him in issue 7 that he can't rebel and is 100% loyal to Eggman. Even Eggman has to reiterate this to Sonic. Just to think that if he left Metal Sonic deactivated and didn't let him run free and respect his decision, none of this would be happening. It's a race for the Emeralds as Tails and Amy deal with the big orange Zeddy, Cream has to deal with a Zeddy controlled Gemeral. While Tails and Amy are able to trick him into getting crushed by the gate and copying his Emerald, Cream gets infected with the virus and Gemeral stays by her side as she gets consumed by it. Silver and Whisper deal with the Hot Topic Zeddy, SPO deals with an escaped Arkham Asylum victim, the Babylon Rogues deal with this old head, and Rouge gets the last emerald. They're all missing one more emerald though, and Zapod uses it to grow big and send some Zombots on the island. Knuckles sacrifices himself to buy everyone more time, so it's up to Sonic, Silver, and Metal to grab the last emerald. Things are looking hella bad for everyone, but then, Super Sonic and Super Silver save the day. But it just happens really quickly. There is no climactic payoff here whatsoever. Zavok is defeated in a single panel, and the virus is sucked up all over this questionably barren landscape by using the warp topaz. Supersonic tries to get rid of it, but gets sent away. So how will the world live without Sonic? Well, before we can answer that question, round two of IDW Sonic's yearly annual is upon us. And what better way to expand more of the Metal Virus storyline and to show us what other characters have been doing during this event. Big's Big Adventure by Flynn, with illustrations by John Gray and colors by newcomer Reggie Graham, gives us a comical look at what Big's been doing since the first issue. After losing Froggy again, we see him surge high and low during the various adventures so far, kind of serving as a bit of a recap and an original adventure. But even after he saves his good old friend, he doesn't even realize that he's getting infected. All he cares about is that he's happy to be home with them. I really like this one. The presentation was amazing, with the colors and Gray's artwork stepping things up a notch. Big's childlike innocence proves a humorous and somewhat dark summary of the book so far. Darkest Hour by Evan Stanley stars some new characters. Night the Owl, a radio station DJ, living with Don the Rooster. What initially looks to be another average day in the office soon turns horrific, 
as the two find out about the metal virus apocalypse. Don wants to leave while they still have the chance, but Knight wants to help out as many people as he can before the virus consumes him on the radio. But after hearing him over the radio, Don sticks by his side to help Knight save some lives. While I think it could have had more pages to flesh things out, Darkest Hour proves an interesting perspective on the virus from a civilian standpoint. Hopefully, we'll get to see more of these two birds in the future. Golner is back, ladies and gentlemen. But what if I told you that this story is actually one of the best ones in the entire lineup? Reflections, featuring art by newcomer Aaron Hammerstrom and colors again by Graham, provides us with a no-dialogue story featuring Metal Sonic. He comes across a jar of metal virus grease and notices a video of Sonic getting infected. <laughs> Seeing this, he decides to dip his finger into the metal virus and... nothing happens. In that brief moment, Metal Sonic realizes that he isn't Sonic. But before he can lament more on his realization, Dr. Starline shoes Metal away. This story really plays into how Metal can never truly be the real Sonic, taking this realization as either showing his superiority or inferiority towards him. Hammerstrom provides some great looking panels, and the cold color palette Graham uses really sets the mood for this story. Eggman's Day Off is written by British author Sarah Grayley and illustrated by Archie artist Lamar Wells. Dr. Eggman shows off a bit of his hobby side by showing off his Sonic action figure collection. While this story is a bit silly, it does leave off some foreshadowing of the animosity between the two, as Starline finds a roboticized action figure of himself. Short, sweet, and definitely building up to some sort of confrontation between the two. Unfortunately, the last two stories in this adventure were not that great and drop the ball in the visual and story department. Flocked together by Samantha King and art by another longtime Archie artist, Jamal Peppers, just shows Astro and Vector rescuing Charmy. There was no reason for them to save him, and in the end, it caused way more harm than good, and feels like it was just such an unnecessary inclusion in this annual. Same goes for Catalyst, by Gigi and art by Abby Balmer. It just shows how Jewel gets infected. I was fine with or without the explanation, but these two feel just so unnecessary and hard to look at. It looks like IDW is starting to form a habit with these side stories overshadowing the main series when it comes to quality over quantity. While I'd love to talk more about the side stories, we really need to finish this Metal Virus saga ASAP. Zavok and the rest of the villains just leave. Some scuffles here and there, but everyone is more concerned over where the hell Sonic even is. Apparently, he got sent all the way to the Soul Dimension and landed in Blaze's garden. He's got a case of amnesia, and that's really about it. Amy steps down from being the group leader and gives that role to Jewel. Tangle and Tails help rub and tumble out of a ditch, because Sonic taught them that we should give people second chances. Oh my god! Silver heads to the future. It's a city. Eggman has some plans with Omega. Starline finally decides that he's gonna stop being the sidekick. Shadow is just standing around on a bunch of platforms. And everyone throws a big celebration party. And then it gets ruined by Eggman. The fight is getting pretty chaotic as everyone tries to save Omega from Eggman. But thankfully, Blades is able to restore Sonic's memories through the Soul Emeralds. Okay, but what did he mean by this? The fight is literally just over once Sonic pulls up on the scene and would you look at that? Sonic just lets him get away after all of that. And thus concludes the Metal Virus Saga. So, what did I think of this event? It was such a mess from start to finish. The introduction had me scratching my head here and there, but I was somewhat impressed to see how long Eggman could keep the heroes down. But as soon as that cure was literally in their hands, the story just kept going and going and I was pretty exhausted with the event. What hurt the Metal Virus story arc was the fact that it got introduced so early in the comics run that we barely had time to establish locations, characters, and more. The characters themselves shut their brains off around the early to mid 20 issues that you have to question who here even has some sort of common sense. The best part of the Metal Virus was none other than the annual, which decided to showcase the event in various perspectives. The presentation is all over the place. Adam Bryce Thomas trades out his free-flowing art style from earlier issues in place of this sometimes weirdly traced model style during the latter part of the event. Priscilla Tramontano's art style is incredibly amateurish with inconsistent proportions and shoddy pencil work. Stanley and Yardley did fine with a few hiccups here and there, but the Mellow Virus as a whole? 
It's a tiring train wreck of a story from start to finish. Well, it's time to step away from the virus and say hello to Chow Races and Badnik Bases by Evan Stanley. Sonic and Tails team up to find some Eggman code in an abandoned base to fix Omega, while Rouge, Amy, and Cream go to White Park Zone to compete in a Chow race to get some Eggman parts for Omega. While the trio are on their way, Amy almost runs into a black guy. During the Chow race, we're introduced to Clutch, who's probably part of the Mafia. He and Rouge talk, and outside the park, Shadow gets jumped by a mysterious cloaked figure. But before we can continue, it's time for one last detour this year. The Bad Guys miniseries. Bad Guys by Ian Flynn follows Dr. Starline's plan to show that he can do better than his idol. He decides to do this by breaking into prison, containing some of the Restoration's biggest haters, and rough and tumble. But it's clear to see that Zavok is already planning to get rid of Starline as the leader sometime soon. They bust out, start a riot, and kick things into high gear as the group plans to raid an Eggman base to collect power cores. Each of these energy cores enhance a specific trait and alter someone's abilities for a short time. Zavok gives Starline a word of advice to carve his own path and surpass Eggman. Suddenly, security pops up, and it's none other than a giant T-Rex robot. But Rough and Tumble hit him with a Kobe and destroy him. They grab some cores, and Starline builds a new MacGuffin, the Tricore. It's soon revealed that in the next issue, that Starline's ragtag group of misfits already suspect that they're being used by him, but they still need him to access the Eggnet and get what he wants. When they reach the Eggnet hub, they all get acquainted with their new powers. Starline accesses the Eggnet, but then everyone turns against him, and Eggman is heading over to the base as they speak. Starline makes a run for it while Mimic slithers into the shadows, and Zavok comes face to face with Eggman. The story ends with Starline taking control of another Eggman base, and now fully dedicates himself to becoming Eggman's replacement. And that was Bad Guys. It had a painfully slow start of setting things up, but everything feels so lukewarm with Starline just using these guys to get some powers. The status quo for almost all these characters go absolutely nowhere. Except for Starline, who is now committed to taking down Eggman and proving that he's better than him. Definitely the weakest spin-off story this year, but solid at best. We now resume back to our regularly scheduled dose of Chow Races and Badnik Bases. Shadow follows a lead from the cloaked figure, which leads him to Clutch's room. Rouge and the others head over there to meet Clutch, and it looks like she's about to sell cheese for $6. But one code word later, and Shadow pulls up for the team assist combo and takes him out with one swift kick. He shows everyone that Clutch has been kidnapping Chow, and they gotta rescue them. Back at the abandoned base, Sonic and Tails get jump scared by a robotic puppet. Her name is Belle, and she's just trying to find her dad. The place gets ambushed, and the squad has to get out ASAP. With the power of Sonic Speed and Belle's weird tail gymnastics, they escape. Belle wants to come along with them, but Sonic just wants to ditch her in the middle of nowhere. I gotta say, it's hella weird that Sonic's acting this way to a new friend when he's perfectly cool with letting a serial killer robot let loose. Sonic and Belle meet up with Amy and Co. Rouge and Tails have gone missing, so Sonic checks things out while the others deal with Tony Soprano's persona and a bunch of badniks. I that prick's face when he saw the gat. Out on the roller coaster, Sonic meets up with Shadow, and the two of them come to find the mysterious cloaked figure, who is none other than Dr. Starline. But he poses a dangerous challenge to the hedgehogs. Save his friends, or stop the imminent avalanche. We end off this year with the final installment of Chow Races and Badnik Bases. Shadow's edginess causes him to not care for the lives of others, so Sonic's gotta evacuate the chateau before it gets snowed in. Omega jump scares Dr. Starline, and Shadow hates women! Okay, but seriously though, first it's Flynn writing Shadow as an insufferable jerk, and now Stanley? What are they smoking in the IDW writer's room and uh, can I get a hit of it? Belle frees the Chows and causes a stampede and Sonic and Shadow save the Chateau. But, uh, that doesn't work, and they evacuate right as the place gets snowed in with poor Starline. Sonic finally overcomes his robotic stereotyping, Omega gets fixed up, and Starline finally has his final piece for his newest creations. Chow Races and Badnik Bases is a mouthful of a title, but a decent step up from the Metal Virus storyline. To be honest, I didn't like the fact that the worldwide apocalypse has no sort of lasting impact on the cast, which is strange, as Flynn attempted to push these characters to their emotional limits, 
The new villain of the week feels pretty mediocre. It looks like the status quo for the characterization of Shadow the Hedgehog is, uh, well, it's, uh, it's something. And we get Belle, who seems to have a bit of mystery surrounding her creation. Hopefully that gets explored as that was the only interesting subplot of this adventure. It's a fun story that is played with multiple problems working against it, but at this point, I'll take something over the Metal Virus storyline any day. Twenty twenty proves to be a frustrating mess of a year. The metal virus had no true impact on the cast and left me fearing the worst for this comic going forward, with only an annual or two that really felt fun to read. Bad guys, while average, has given me a bit of hope in seeing what Starline is up to next. And Chow Racing and Badnik Bases is a pretty weak 7 out of 10 storyline that, while fun, has me conflicted with the writing quality of Evan Stanley. With two more years left of this comic, can Stanley go above and beyond with her next outing? Or are we going into another year of mediocrity? Stanley is back at it again with a new adventure, titled Test Run. It's about time that Belle fills out a job application. She gets a job with this monkey, but uh-oh, Belle is just an absolute klutz. Tangle pulls up and she and Belle find out that the weather is acting kinda freaky recently. Sonic and friends head to the source with Tangle and Belle sneaking in on the adventure too. Soon however, the rooms in the base are acting pretty trippy. This leads them into a creepy small town. As Tango and Belle sneak through Eggman's base, we soon find out that Badniks don't even react to her. Weird. Sonic, Tails, and Amy venture through the House of Horrors and come across combined Badniks. Thankfully, Tango and Belle are here to stop Orbot and Cubot from the outside. Eggman teleports the trio into a room full of various egg vipers, each with their own elemental capabilities. Tangle and Belle find out that Sonic and friends are in trouble, so Tangle jumps in in one of the Rick and Morty portals. We finally get hit with the big reveal that Belle's dad is none other than Dr. Eggman. This confrontation alone sets Belle crying. Oh, and uh, the portals are about to explode. While the homies enjoy another unemployed Tuesday afternoon, Belle just wants her dad back. Test Run is a trippy adventure that gives us some interesting backstory on my favorite FNAF animatronic. Sonic and friends traversing through the town, and Eggman speaking through the toaster was quite funny and interesting. Belle's moment was the highlight of this adventure, adding a decent emotional bit to the story. We also get introduced to a new artist. Well, I guess in quotations. While originally joining the art team as a colorist during the Metal Virus story arc, Playboy Cardi Curry does some of the artwork here. It's good, kind of a weird hybrid of Stanley and Thomas about the detail. I gotta say, Evan Stanley's stories were fun. A nice change of pace from the hellhole that was the metal virus. I gotta say though too, these stories do feel out of place from said event. You'd really expect the world would have changed in some way, shape, or form from the virus, but it didn't. It feels like these characters just metaphorically walked it off. Anyway, Flynn is back in the driver's seat with Zeddies? I'ma be real here, but I don't think the Zeddy have that much to work with to make a whole story arc about them. And I'm not even the biggest fan of these guys to begin with. So let's see how Flynn handles these surface level stereotypes that we call characters. 41 begins another battle as usual with Sonic and Eggman. The Doctor is out in the hunt for Zeddies after the Metal Virus. Speaking of the Zeddy, they're on a rampage through various towns. Since they're far from the Lost Hex, they take the opportunity to wage a full-on attack against the Restoration. The squad joins in on a Zoom call and decide to stay at select locations to round up the Zeddy and use Tails' brand new Zeddy zappers to subdue them and kick them back to the Lost Hex. Guess who? It's me, Elbro, and I'm gonna tell you about this. So the panel starts out as the Deadly Six decides to hit a devious lick on a public area. I think Ian Flynn knows something we don't. The Bug, Whisper, and Tangles, and don't forget about Perry, the Platypus are, are in the building. So the Deadly Six was just beating up people making not so obvious references, 
and just being menaces. Somebody got to put NBA Youngboy on the team. So the bug tells everybody on the Skype call to pull up. Dr. Starline hypnotizes the big fat yellow dude that looks like Phantom. Speaking about Starline, he also beats up Gorilla Dude. And like the little genius that Belle is, she gets kidnapped by Dr. Starline. And who, who is that? Is that my boy Sonic the Hedgehog? So while Sonic is moving around at the speed of sound, he passes the main villain, Dr. Starline, like a complete idiot. That's it for me. Back to you, Strangster. Thanks for adding on to the Yap Fest, OG. Before we can get into the fight, it's time to take a detour with a new special to celebrate Sonic's 30th anniversary with the 30th anniversary special. Three stories in one, starting with Seasons of Chaos. Sonic, Tails, and Amy are venturing through Spring Valley Zone and spot a Chaos Emerald, but Metal Sonic shows up only just to take it from them. Knuckles even shows up to explain the same thing literally happened to him over at Angel Island with Metal Knuckles. The trio run off to find Metal, but poor old Amy is left behind, wishing she could prove herself if the homies even gave her a chance. Thankfully, Mighty and Ray are here to help Amy out. Team Sonic comes face to face with the hooligans and battles for the nearby Chaos Emerald. Unfortunately, they lose the emerald, or not. While Amy and the others try to catch up, Tails doll spies on them. As we can see, the Heavy King has been monitoring everybody's emerald count. Everyone catches up with Eggman in Autumn Forest Zone, and the last emerald is stolen yet again by another metal robot. Eggman finally spills the beans and explains that Heavy King was put in charge and was a bit too good at his job, and sent up the metal duo to search for the emeralds. Everyone teams up and fights the Heavy King, who's got powers. Sonic decides to hit the Heavy King with some classic roasting. You smell like you farted. 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 Eggman takes control and is about to stop Sonic and friends, but they're gone. The gang hides the emeralds and thus ends Seasons of Chaos, a fantastic adventure through some beautifully illustrated zones by three different artists. Newcomer Thomas Roethlisberger joins up with Yardley and Hammerstrom with colors by Reggie Graham to create one of the best looking IDW Sonic stories so far. The adventure is pretty funny, the both Amy's insecurities were handled really well, and having the heroes work together with the villain is always a fun blast. And we're not done yet, as the next adventure features Sonic behind the wheel with the creatively titled story, Sonic Learns to Drive, written by the McElroy brothers. Sonic is doing his driver's test with his instructor, Kip the Capybara. However, it looks like he doesn't even know the rules of the road. Kip asks what we're all thinking. Why does Sonic even need a driver's license? Glizzy. Sonic wants to enter a rally race for a lifetime supply of chili dogs. Too bad he failed his test. He gets a second chance and is doing pretty good. But the race is about to start, and he's got to get there fast. Kip decides to let him break all the rules to get those chili dogs. This is a silly adventure that decides to focus on the humor and absurdity of Sonic's inability to drive and his love for chili dogs, even influencing Kip to let him break the rules. I had a good chuckle over this one, and it was aided by some fantastic art by another newcomer, Mauro Fonseca, who's done work on the fan continuation of Sonic the Comic. His style captures the style of classic Sonic perfectly, with some fantastic facial expressions and various references scattered throughout the story. The final story focuses this time on Dr. Eggman, written by our final newcomer, Gail Galligan, and art this time by Roethlisberger alone, and colors by Nathalie Foundrain. It's his birthday and he's pretty grumpy. Every year his bad nicks try to win his affection, but he just tells them to knock it off. This time, however, to make their creator proud, they've waged an attack on Sonic. Eggman calls it off and admits that he appreciates the company of his bad nicks. They retort with a birthday cake, short but sweet. While not that big on Eggman treating his bad nicks like his kids, this came off as quite charming actually. They just want to acknowledge that they appreciate him and would go out of their way to fight Sonic just to make him proud. Overall, the IW Sonic 30th anniversary is one of the best comics in this series. With fantastic art and hilarious stories, this is the pinnacle of IDW Sonic. Well, time to jump back into the Zeddy Hunt yet again. As Sonic fights the Zeddies, it looks like he's actually getting the upper hand with some help from Tangle and Whisper, but the tides turn as the 6v1 is too much for the Hedgehog to handle. Tails arrives just in time and zaps all the Zeddies, but soon they're all informed that Bell is gone. 
the Zeti finally get deported back to the Lost Hex. But before they walk into the spaceship, Zavok laughs at Sonic for sparing him and his team, threatening to come back and make him regret keeping him alive. This gives Sonic a flashback of his morality backfiring. He doubles down yet again and states that he won't sacrifice his principles out of fear. His principles in question cause him to manipulate his friends, deny accountability, and act hypocritical towards Metal and Eggman. And through all of that, he still would rather back down instead of standing up and face the facts that he isn't doing a good job at being a hero. The Zeti are finally gone, but we still have a missing puppet to find. Starline tells Belle the truth that her dad, Mr. Tinker, is gone, and only Eggman remains. We get more info on Belle and how she was eventually kicked out of the village, as she was blamed by the townsfolk for the metal virus. While she tells her story, he's getting various data about her emotions. Starline escapes with the chaotics on his tail, and Belle is broken. Emotionally, not literally. And that was Zeddy Hunt. Man, I have mixed feelings on this whole adventure. The main attraction of the Zeddies had the typical build-up and surprisingly decent second part, with catching Sonic and Co. by surprise, and Starline kidnapping Belle for unknown reasons. But the last two issues somewhat fall apart with the Zeddy vs. Sonic, which had some notably unpleasant art by Archie veteran Jamal Peppers. It's strange seeing how static and lifeless his work is here compared to his Archie stuff, Sonic's mindset is slowly deteriorating and is low-key becoming kinda delusional with not learning from his mistakes. The Bell stuff is interesting, but man, it was just underwhelming with how easily they were all taken down. It had a slow introduction, a fantastic ambush, but an abysmal finish. Free Comic Book Day reels us back into the world of classic Sonic, with Amy showing Tails her hobby of making comics of the adventures of Sonic and friends. She is a bit ashamed about it and thinks that they aren't that good, but once Tails shows them off to the locals, they all enjoy them, and even Sonic himself. Amy's new hobby is an adorable story. It's simple and fun. Sonic and friends being supportive of her hobby was incredibly sweet. This little story is on par with the 30th anniversary special, for being such an enjoyable read this year. There's technically a second story here called Race to the Empire, but I'm not really counting it as a story since it's just a recap of what's been going on with the series so far. Moving on, we're back with the main series with Trial by Fire, another Stanley Hood classic here. Amy's going camping with the girls. Whisper's not here though. She's gonna hunt for Mimic because someone freed the homie. The squad sets up camp, and plays Una with these tarot cards. Amy draws Belle's card, but before she can even say what it is, Belle jump scares her and it burns away into the fire. While everyone is sleeping, Belle stumbles across a motobug who jumps her. Amy and the others wake up to find the whole forest on fire. With Belle and the camp's owner's son missing, the team split up to save the forest. The motobug helps out Belle, and the two meet up with Tangle to get the hell out of here. Meanwhile, Amy and Joel deal with the campers, who coordinate a plan to contain the fire spread and keep the others safe. Belle, Tangle, and the Motobug find the camp owner's son, who reveals that the cause of the fire was done by two mysterious individuals. As the four of them venture through some rushing water and meeting up with the other campers, Joel has a plan, and with the power of teamwork, they stop the fire. Tangle quits the restoration, Tails fixes up Belle's hand, and Tangle is off to look for Whisper. Trial by Fire is a decent adventure that has some good build-up and character interaction between some of the IDW originals, such as Belle, and especially Jewel. However, when the action becomes the center of attention, the story kinda dipped a bit, especially with the final part having them figure out a plan easily and subdue the fire in record time. I like where things are leading up though, with the mysterious duo and the Chaotix getting involved, but for what it is, Trial by Fire is a good story that kinda suffers in the end with its quick conclusion and lack of tension of the stakes at hand. Our final issue is another miniseries that takes a look at two new original characters as part of Starline's plan to beat Eggman with Imposter Syndrome. By using all of his previous know-how, Starline successfully creates a duo of cybernetically enhanced villains to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sonic and Tails, and break the Sonic cycle, Surge and Kit. After another grueling test, Surge wants to go further beyond, but she and Kit get hit with some sleep hypnosis and send them out to do a little trolling at some campgrounds. 
Too bad some pink hedgehog and her friends put it out. Serge is slowly getting more and more frustrated, but then questions if she even wants to fight Sonic. They haven't even met, so what's driving her to destroy him in the first place? Starline puts the duo into sleep again, and finally puts parts of his plan into action, with taking out one of Eggman's bases. For the first issue alone, Imposter Syndrome does some decent buildup in the Starline's little meta moment of getting rid of the never-ending cycle. Surge and Kit come off as a little bit annoying in the first half, but there is some hinted depth into the two, with the realization of what is even causing them to act like Sonic's biggest haters without even knowing him. While I can't say too much about this adventure, it's a nice glimpse into Starline's future outings against Eggman and the Restoration. was actually quite the positive year this time around. The 30th anniversary outings were nothing but pure fun, combined with some amazing artwork to boot. Stanley goes two for two on some interesting stories, with some fantastic character interaction and development with individuals new and old. While Flynn unfortunately came out the gate stumbling with the Zeddy Hunt fiasco, he definitely picked things back up with the introduction of Surge and Kit. The future is looking kind of bright here, not gonna lie. But will the last year on this list keep the momentum going? Let's find out with the last year, 2022. We continue with the remaining issues of imposter syndrome with issue two. Team Starline head over to an Eggman base. Serge decides to do her own thing and heads to the tower, only to be stopped by a super bad Nick. But it's no match for the dynamic duo. Starline takes control of the new Eggman base. The two, however, question how they didn't die and wonder what their origins truly are. So it's time to do a little snooping through Starline's files. The duo find out why they're made and even see that they were possibly kidnapped and were influenced by Starline's mind control to become who they are today. Starline catches them and tries to subdue the both of them, but they put him to sleep. Serge decides that she and Kit need to ultimately get rid of both Sonic, Eggman, and anyone who follows them once and for all. Kit decides that they should use Starline's plan to get rid of Sonic and Tails, and leave the doctors to themselves. So, the finale brings us to the trio storming Eggman's biggest fortress yet, taking out Badniks left and right. Eggman gets alerted and sends in Metal Sonic, but clearly the 2v1 is too much for the Robo Doppelganger. Starline takes control of Eggman's badniks, and it looks like it's truly over for Eggman. Or is it? Imposter Syndrome is a great set of issues that explores Surge and Kit, along with Starline's ultimate goal of defeating the man he once idolized. There is some interesting character development with Surge and Kit, showcasing the insecurities that Surge has trying to live up as being better than Sonic, and the sibling-esque dynamic of her and Kit, along with the eventual turn of the duo against their creator. However, I can't say the same for Starline, who pushes these two with these constant training routines and hypes them up for this big confrontation between him and Eggman, only for that to never even happen at all in this miniseries, making the ending feel incomplete. While it had some great issues with the first three installments, Imposter Syndrome does drop the ball in the end. Okay, but we need to reel things back before we hit issue 50. So let's start with issue 48. The Chaotix investigate a case that leads them to some trouble downtown. Some old homeless guy says that it might have to do with something in the sewers, leading the Chaotix getting gassed. But what's this? They find a box that leads them to the central shipping yard. The Chaotix find Clutch along with Rough and Tumble, but apparently, they had nothing to do with it. I wonder who did, though. They leave, not before sinking all Clutch's supplies down in the ocean. This soon leads us back with Sonic, Tails, and Bell reprogramming all of the Badniks through the usage of a signal. However, in the middle of the night, the Badniks get a little quirky and attack Sonic and Tails. They save Bell, who tells them that the Badniks are heading to a secret function and follow them to Eggman City. Bell also discovers a letter from Mr. Tinkerer to help give us a bit of closure on that subplot and express his love for his creation. She thinks that she hasn't made a difference 
but she has over the course of the series. With a bit of encouragement from Sonic, the trio storm Eggman's base. But before we jump into the big battle, I know, I know, but hold your suspense, ladies and gentlemen. We got two specials to take a look at. To promote his latest theatrical appearance, IDW, along with help from the movie team, created the Sonic the Hedgehog 2 movie prequel. Five stories created by Kiel Fegley, and here to show us what the movie cast have been doing since the first adventure. Let's check him out. Hedgehog Day Afternoon stars Sonic on another adventure. He is literally the unemployed friend on a Tuesday afternoon, and finds out on the local news that a robbery is going on with some egg tech. Sonic pulls up, but the thieves get the upper hand and throw the homie into a comically large safe. But by using his super speed, he busts out the safe and stops the criminals. The story ends with one of the egg drones used in the robbery returning Eggman's glove to Agent Stone. The story continues with Agent Stone in The Secret of My Distress. Stone gets a job at a coffee shop and uses some egg tech to move up from employee to boss, taking out almost everyone in the business and even getting the boss Karen arrested for money laundering. Gotta say, I love how chaotic and silly these first two stories are. They have some great action-packed moments and Agent Stone's story was pretty funny, not gonna lie. Seeing him just manipulate his way into becoming the boss was pretty good. However, these next three stories take place in Movie Sonic's dimension, starting with Knuckles the Echidna traveling across the world and getting captured and being forced to fight against a giant lobster monster. It kind of just ends pretty quickly and there's not much else other than the lobster fight. Two for the Road has Tails track down Sonic's chaos energy to meet up with him. It shows him venturing through various Sonic zones while also being chased by something. It's cool to see some of the zones make their way into the movie-verse, and the mysterious lizard people are a neat touch, but it does feel kind of quick and too short for its liking. The Last Adventure stars Dr. Robotnik back on the Mushroom Planet, and he is getting high off those things. But the shrooms fight back, and so does he, bring the whole place up and promising to come back and cause mayhem on that hedgehog. Dr. Robotnik's adventure was hella fun, with him going crazy on mushrooms and even fighting back was entertaining to see. It was pretty short like the rest of these, but this was definitely my favorite out of the bunch. The Sonic 2 prequel is a collection of some fun stories. They do a great job at giving us a small sneak peek into the world of the Sonic movie universe and do their job at hyping up the reader into seeing the new film. They were a bit too short, but they made up for being quite entertaining. Anyway, on to our next adventure starring Team Sonic on the Floating Island. Free Comic Book Day 2022 gives us a new adventure, Deep Trouble, by Ian Flynn with art by Brad Accardi Curry. Knuckles calls up Sonic and Tails to help them investigate some strange rumbling on his island. Sonic and Tails have this stupid ah hell debate about how to pronounce Hydro City. Let me know in the comments how you pronounce it. They find Eggman who's been drilling around for minerals. With the power of teamwork, Eggman runs away. I mean, what do you honestly want me to say? It's about as average as it gets. Sonic and Tails show up to help Knuckles, and Eggman goes down really easy. The art looks good for the most part, a bit loose for my liking, and that shot of Angel Island looks incredibly rushed. Overall, it's fine. Nothing more, nothing less. But now, it's finally time for the moment you've all been waiting for. Issue 50 finally gives us the big battle between Team Starline, Eggman, and Sonic. As Starline enjoys his brand new throne, Eggman finally pulls up to face Starline. Team Sonic finds Metal Sonic just chillin'. Sonic and Tails have been in an argument about the fact that it was Sonic's choice to reactivate him after the Battle for Angel Island arc. But before they can continue, everyone gets jumped by imposters and badniks. Surge finally gets to talk face to face with Sonic pointing out the glaring flaws of his morality. If he had just taken Eggman out, she wouldn't have been made, so she's here to end that cycle. Except Sonic kinda just doesn't really care about what she's talking about. Bro hits her with the, okay, and they fight. Tails and Kit fight, but he tries to talk to Kit, asking what's wrong with them, even volunteering to help him out. But one mention of Sonic, and Kit goes berserk. 
Meanwhile, Sonic is doing the complete opposite, and dumbs down Surge's mental insanity as nothing more than a shtick, disregarding where she's coming from because he's supposedly been through this before. So, he decides to give her the Declaration of Independence. To be honest, despite being long as hell, Sonic's statement here is perfectly fine. Too bad, not even Sonic follows his own ideals, as shown from earlier, treating this freedom ideology as nothing more than ultimatums. He even contradicts himself at the end of Surge's fight with this. Bro wants to give everyone freedom, but if they don't choose his way of freedom, they gotta go, even forcing them to choose his route, which by definition isn't freedom. In the middle of both of these conflicts, Starlight and Eggman have an epic mech battle, but Eggman is ultimately defeated with the power of Starlight's Tricor. Too bad he's been one step ahead of him this entire time, using the Egg Emperor to force Starlight to use his Tricor, wearing his goggles to block out the Thug Shaker mind control, and hitting him with the command grab. Bell and Metal pull up, she dips, and Starline gets killed by a bunch of metal pipes. What a way to go out for one of the IW Sonic villains of all time. Tails times out Kit and waits for his water supply to go out and brings little bro with the rest of the gang. Eggman finally takes control of his base and brings out every bad nick imaginable against the trio. Overall, issue 50 is strange to say the least. On one hand, it's a fantastic action-packed adventure, with three battles in one issue coming to an okay at best conclusion. Finally having the imposters face off against the OGs was fun. Kinda. In the same case as the fate of Dr. Ragman, its biggest problem is the unnecessary character assassination of Sonic T. Hedgehog. His sociopathic mindset really gets turned to 11. Tails and Kit get a great moment together, with him trying to talk and reason with them. Eggman and Starline gave us the big confrontation we've all been waiting for, and it was probably the best part of this entire comic. In conclusion, IDW Sonic's 50th issue is a great issue that suffers from driving its protagonist further into the ground and leaving the imposter's adventure on an interesting cliffhanger. Sonic and the gang continue their escape through Eggman's one-to-one -one recreation of Baltimore with Metal Sonic and a horde of badniks on their toes. Also, Starline's dead. Can we get a moment of silence for our homie? Just kidding, Rip Bozo. Welcome to that Starline pack, baby. Surge finds out that fall damage was turned off, so she survived. But if she's gonna go back outside, she's gonna need some powers. Belle uses her built-in Google Maps to find a shuttle to get the hell out of here. Sonic escapes with the homies, but then Metal Sonic recreates a terrorist attack leaving the hero stranded in Baltimore. The squad does their best to escape Metal Sonic in the city. He just doesn't know when to quit. Meanwhile, Surge finds out that Starline is dead. Rip Bozo! Smoking that Starline pack and raids through Eggman's stuff to find a Hellcat supercharger, and she goes a bit brazy with this. Metal gets sent home before he can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sonic once again. Surge decides to go for a spin, but finds out that the supercharger gives her schizophrenia. This little imaginary Starline decides to taunt her, making her believe that she was better off dead. Sonic gets fixed up and tells Kit the bad news that Surge is dead, which, you know, it's kinda sad. They were like the best of friends too. And it Back up in Detroit, Surge is destroying everyone's subwoofers. Whisper pulls up with her wisp just in time for Surge to lose her powers but then she realizes what she's wearing and gets high off of Wisps. Whisper is down yet again, Sonic pulls up, and Surge's schizophrenia is still going crazy. But we have to pause on that adventure as we have three more side stories to look at, starting with the 2022 Annual. The first story, Guardians by Flynn, gives us a glimpse into Blaze's world in which she finally eliminates all of Captain Whisker's crew. With no more ops left to disturb her, she goes to Knuckles for help on what to do since he's a guardian. He drops some knowledge on her about stepping away from her responsibilities. Knuckles says for her to take this opportunity. The Soul Emeralds are safe and guarded, unlike him, who's stuck with the Master Emerald. And that means he barely gets a chance to hop off the island. Blaze takes his advice and begins her vacation by hanging out with the homies. This was great! I love seeing some great character building with Knuckles and Blaze. While they may have the same issue on the surface, one is a chance to be free, 
and the other is forever stuck with a giant green rock. Being able to see how they view their roles as guardians was quite an enjoyable experience. In Weapons by newcomer Daniel Barnes, Omega finally gets rebuilt, so he and General go for a little test run. We get a little dive into the mindsets of these two robots. Omega seeing General as inferior due to his more domesticated lifestyle, while General sees his relationship with the rabbits as a way of evolving himself to be better. This is definitely on the same level as Guardians, in where we get to see a comparison between two characters that are a bit similar on the surface. Hero Camp by another newcomer, India Swift, delivers us our silly all hell adventure of the day, with Cream and other locals. Orbot and Cubot are the counselors and try capturing the kids. Too bad they suck at that, and the kids use what they learn throughout the story against them. What can I say? It's a pretty average adventure with Cream and Friends. The next story is a sequel to Silver's Drug Emporium from the 2019 annual, and the homie is sad yet again. Espio shows up to help the Hedgehog, who feels like he has no idea why he's even here. Espio helps Silver out with understanding his fear, and that he has friends that are always here to help him out when danger arrives. The resolution is a bit too quick for my liking, but other than that, future growth is a great issue that explores Silver's uncertainties with the future, and the reassuring factor that he has friends by his side at all time. While these stories have been great, we of course have one stinker in this annual, this time with a Jet the Hawk story by Ian Mulcher, best well known for writing The Murder of Sonic the Hedgehog. In this story, Jet just yaps for the entire adventure, being oblivious to being captured by a giant Eggman robot because he's mad that Whisper's Wisp stole his calzone. Our last adventure stars Mordecai and Rigby, written and illustrated by Aaron Hammerstrom. Rough and Tumble split and later team up with Rouge and Tangle to steal a diamond. Apparently, the homies were so desperate for a replacement for the other that they teamed up with these two. Ruff and Tumble soon realize that they both kind of had the same plan of stealing the diamond. Tangle stops the two skunks, but Rouge leaves with the diamond, and our annual comes to a close. Overall, the annual was kind of more of the same, in which we had a great selection of adventures, both serious and unserious, with the exception of, yes, one story. This is definitely another hood classic in IDW's Library of Banger Annuals. Daniel Barnes delivers us a spooky adventure with Sonic and Tails, as they crash land on a mysterious island full of badniks from yesteryear, and it looks like poor homeboy creased his shoes during the fall. After getting spooked by Mecha Sonic and some weird badnik amalgamations called Scrapniks, Tails shows up to tell them that they're chill as hell. Tails starts geeking, and Mecha starts tweaking. Tails gets Google Translate working, and is able to communicate with the Scrapniks. E Sigma over here says that they gotta fix the plane, in the meantime, Mechasonic shows them a mysterious flower that washed on the shore. He hopes to plant it sometime soon. Sigma shows them around the egg carrier while he tries his best to find a part for the tornado. Sonic gives another long all hell speech, but this time it's just him admiring Mechasonic's new change in life and asks to be friends. But that gets interrupted by Mecha Knuckles, who is going insane due to his old Eggman programming. He hits Mecha so hard, he gets strange twisted memories of his old fight during Sonic 3, causing him to snap and go rogue. Sonic gets captured, and a nearby Scrapnik relays the bad news to Tails and the others. He builds a gun, and he and the others go Mecha hunting. Too bad Mecha sneaks them, steals Tails' iPad, and takes them all out, leaving just him and Sonic. We end Scrapnik Island with Mecha attempting to put Sonic in him through literally downloading his mind. The Scrapniks jump him, causing the mind transfer device to explode. However, Sonic has a bit of Mecha's mind in him. While Mecha thinks Sonic's reached his limit, Sonic proves him wrong as they race through a large factory. Sonic hits Mecha with a kick to the head, causing him to return back to normal. Mecha is about to sacrifice himself to the fires below believing that he's failed both his old and new objectives. Sonic tells Mecha that he has to give himself purpose in life to breathe in this blue trap bubble. The Scrapniks save the homies, and his programming gets tweaked, so Eggman's former influence is no more. We end Scrapnik Island with Mecha thanking Sonic for showing him the light and helping to face the uncertainties of life head on. Scrapnik Island is a fantastic story thanks to its incredible presentation and horror-esque themes to deliver a story of Sonic helping one of his oldest enemies 
turn over a new leaf. This surprisingly emotional story was aided by its monster movie location and outstanding pencil work from Jack Lawrence, who has really nailed the look of Sonic and Friends since his debut. Natalie Foundrain's colors also give this comic a really distinct look with a dark and cold color palette that can switch things up when the time is right. This is without a doubt the best IDW Sonic story of all time. Okay, last side story, starring Tails in his own 30th anniversary special. Flynn delivers us a new adventure with Sonic and Tails on Flicky Island. However, things are way too quiet. No Flickies, random meth crystals, and rails all around. What are you even talking about here, Sonic? These three goobers are getting the Flickies high, and so does Sonic, who gets kidnapped by MF Doom? Of course, this would have anyone absolutely scared, and Tails is no exception, so he teams up with the KFC menu to rescue the birds, stop MF Doom's group of hooligans, and save Sonic before he ODs on meth. Tails ventures through various zones and grabs hearts left and right from MF Doom's homies. After defeating Bugs Bunny over here, Tails finally gives himself some firepower and duels with the villain himself in Panic Puppet Zone. Sonic is freed, but he gives Tails a chance to be the hero of the day, using the crystal powers against MF Doom and turning him into a big meth crystal. Tails' birthday bonanza is a fun, action-packed adventure with my favorite rapper. It's always a treat seeing a character other than Sonic take the center stage. While it does feel a lot more like a video game, and Tails getting over his insecurities has been a story told multiple times, the presentation and the silly dialogue from MF Doom made this stand out. Not better than the previous 30th anniversary special, but a good issue nonetheless. Back in the main series, Sonic and Tails pull up to take Surge down. Whisper gives Sonic a wisp, but Surge is just too powerful. Tails has an idea, and leads Sonic into a local Home Depot. With the help of some Looney Tunes odd traps, Tails wires Surge to a bunch of washing machines. Kit finally shows up, only to find out that Sonic supposedly lied to him, bringing her back to Starline's old base. Sonic and Tails promise to get Whisper's Wisp back. Eggman and Metal are on their way to find the missing Dynamo Cage, and Surge and Kit have a plan to take down Sonic and Tails. Surge gets more horsepower at Starline's base. Sonic and Tails get jumped by Metal, and Eggman gets jumped by Surge. Eggman can't handle the average Memphis resident, and teams up with Sonic and Tails to stop her. They look through some of Starline's plans, and find out Surge and Kit's backstory. Sonic just wants to talk, but they're here to fight, causing a brawl. Surge causes the place to flood with water, everyone is practically out of the picture, with Metal down, and the two foxes staying on the sidelines. Sonic tries to force Surge to be free once again, going against his pre-established mindset of respecting people's choices because they don't align with his ultimatum. Surge decides to hit Sonic with the electric chair special, exclaiming that she doesn't have any sort of freedom, not while he's still alive. Which, if we're really going to be looking at the Hedgehog's track record, she's kinda not wrong. Allowing villains to live on tormenting people on the daily, and restricting said freedom to characters who literally show up to pose no harm really makes you think if this is the guy you want parading around the ideas of freedom. Kit tags in to take Surge away and bury everyone in Starline's base. They all escape, even Eggman somehow, and that's it. What the hell happened with the story? For starters, Surge went from going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sonic to stumbling over bolts and almost blowing up. She doesn't pose a threat nor a challenge to the heroes, even with all those powers. Sonic practically has no idea how to talk to his rivals, not letting her change out of their own volition or his influence, just point blank, be free. The post-50 Surge saga ultimately fails in creating a proper original rival that could challenge Sonic. The titular blue porcupine himself practically has no remorse for the homie up until the very end, which could even be put into question with his last words ultimately leaving us with a mishandled and directionless villain who went out on a whimper. <music> 2022 was a strange year to end things off with, simultaneously giving us one of the best stories of all time and one of the most aggravating stories of all time delivering us with a banger set of rivals who felt like they served their purpose. 
but somehow got an unnecessary extended second part that butchered them till Kingdom Come, with the cherry on top being a confusing hero who compromises his unnecessary code for the sake of the plot's demand. Wow, those are indeed numbers on the screen, aren't they? At the time of me writing this script and recording this video, IDW Sonic is still up and about, with it about to finish its latest year. And to be honest, this current year has me somewhat confused, excited, and disappointed on where the series will ultimately go, with new characters taking in more screen time than the heroes, leaving mixed results, and side stories stealing the show once again. 2023 has left me with some mixed optimism on where IDW Sonic is going, with some of my critiques being addressed, but new problems emerging within each installment of this comic. What do I mean by that? Well, let's wind back to the first arc of this year with the main series, Urban Warfare. Sonic, along with Tangle, Whisper, and random background OC number 40 named Lanolin, decide to raid Eggman's recreation of Baltimore. Tangle says a funny six letter word starting with N and ending in R that pisses off Whisper. So there's some beef going on between them. When they pull up, they get separated and sent through a Rick and Morty portal. That's a decent way to start things off with this story, but where it falls apart is when Sonic's friends just show up and power through Eggman's forces. Don't forget the Rush Pathos segment with the Diamond Cutters and this haphazard apology scene. I'll admit, however, that 59 is the shining gem of this mess, with the stakes getting turned up thanks to fake emeralds, hordes of shadow androids, and shadow bugging off fentanyl. Yeah, some of this dialogue could give Ken Penders a run for his money, but it does a great job in making the Emerald City a threat. However, it all falls down in the end, with the story rushing its last two issues. With most of the action feeling so insignificant, such as Tangle jumping out of a building, only for her to magically get the ability to phase through matter only when the plot allows it, or Sonic getting captured for a split second, only for him to jump back into the fray to fight Metal in an instant. It's moments like these that make urban warfare such a sloppy mess. This entire story is carried by incredible art, but abysmal plot contrivances. The focus on the Diamond Cutters and newcomer Lanolin are so meaningless that the plot would have literally been the same if they weren't there. A lot of hype surrounding the arc neglects the story itself and pushes the visuals over anything else. Which, while they are top notch this time around with Adam Bryce Thomas winning me over with his newer style, it doesn't excuse the mediocre mess of a story. But on the other hand, 2023 brought along another 30th anniversary special, with everyone's favorite pink hedgehog on a quest to save her friends from the clutches of Eggman with help of her cards that warn her of imminent danger and tell her about various traits about her friends, even saving the day and putting Metal Sonic in the can. Playboy Cardi's Summer Smash is another fantastic adventure that focuses on Jewel the Beetle. While the homies go band for band against the Babylon Rogues in a tournament, Jewel gets to shine, as she's finally pulled away from her desk at the restoration and gets time to not only enjoy herself and the company of her friends, but also help pitch in at the end. She's been practically overlooked by everyone and wants to be noticed, and thankfully, this little adventure was just the thing she needed. However, within the good and the bad of this year, there's remaining stories, which still feel quite directionless and strange, such as the 900th Adventure, which was advertised as a celebration of Sonic comic history, only for it to be a run-of-the-mill story with Sonic and friends getting rid of the warped topaz because it huh? showed up, I guess. The unnecessarily long dialogue, lackluster story, an incredibly quick pacing couldn't save this special. Even bringing in the GOAT, Nigel Kitching, didn't make the read any less unbearable. While there were efforts in making each section distinct, it ultimately becomes kind of a narrative mess. The new Misadventure storyline is one that I'm 50-50 on. We've already had Day in the Life adventures with the annuals, so devoting a decent amount of the book yet again to this feels kind of tiring. There have been some decent adventures, such as 63's globe-trotting adventure starring Sonic and Blaze, bringing back the themes of the 2022 annual and having Blaze question her role as a protector and guardian. Knuckles and the Chaotix have a Cilia adventure, and 62 even allowed us to see the Guardian and Amy Rose explore through Angel Island for a bit. All these fun, low-stakes adventures are great to help explore a bit of IDW Sonic's world, and even add a bit of character development to some of the titular cast. 
However, arguably the biggest criticism is none other than the Diamond Cutter's plot with Clutch giving Mimic a chance at revenge against Whisper by disguising himself as Duo, and completely botching the job within a day by revealing himself to Silver. Whisper and Silver team up to take him down, but Lanolin decides to take the new guy's side instead of listening to her friends, even trying to boss an OG like Silver for the sake of keeping things going. And things may even get better or worse, as the time you're recording this video, this little green midget and water boy over here are switching sides? They they made a Halloween special, uh, it, it's fine I guess. 2023 itself has some stuff going for it. This new era of grounding things has been working well for the most part. I'm honestly all in for this if it means that the writing team does more of exploring this world. For the past couple of years, it felt like nothing more than a blank slate, probably thanks to a metal virus adventure or two. But with the dust settling after the Urban Warfare arc, this could be a fresh start for the series to really prove itself to be a good adaptation of the source material, to show why you should care about these newcomers or pre-established casts, and what they add to the grand scheme of things, to showcase locations new and old. I, I could go on about this, but with five years already passed, IDW still has a chance to redeem itself. But as for now, only time will tell to see where this current direction of the comic will lead us. So. IDW Sonic as a whole, it's uh, fine I guess. In some cases, more often with the side content and select stories, the IDW Sonic series is able to deliver on that front. But as we've seen, majority of this series does have problems that do hold it back from being a great series. Which I honestly hope they improve on in the end, as unlike the previous comics mentioned on this channel, it's still going. So here's hopes to IDW Sonic. The Sonic comic of all time. Thank you everyone for watching this video. It's been a wild ride, but long story short, it's over. If you enjoyed what you watched, consider liking, commenting, and subscribing.